we've seen conservative vector fields, and we looked at a test that works if our vector field is defined on all of R2 or all of R3. As of right now, we are not considering vector fields which may have holes in the domain, places where they're undefined. Such a vector field is this one. So f of x and y equals 2xy minus sine x, comma, x squared plus 2y. This is a nice vector field defined on all of R2. Is this vector field conservative? We'll apply our test to figure that out. It turns out it will be conservative, which means that there's some scalar valued function of x and y whose gradient would be this vector field capital F. In fact, there's an entire family of potential functions. There's not just one. I'll go through an algorithm to find those potential functions. So how do we take our gradient vector field and kind of undo the gradient so that we get back the scalar valued function of two variables? Okay, so first let's look at the test. In the language of the test, 2xy minus sine x is what we were calling the component function p, and x squared plus qy is what we were calling q. The test we've seen asks the question, is dp dy equal to dq dx? I would like to rephrase that test in an equivalent way. By defining something called the 2D scalar curl, that's my language for it, that's not necessarily standard. This is not the true curl of a vector field because the true curl is only defined on vector fields in R3. So this is not a real cross product. And what the 2D scalar curl is, is qx minus py. If we look back at the true curl, you'll see that's the third coordinate of the curl of a vector field in R3. So there is a connection. Okay, so let's compute dq dx. That is 2x. And then we need to subtract off dp dy, which is also 2x. So the 2d scalar curl of this vector field is zero which means that this vector field is conservative. Notice if dq dx minus dp dy is zero, that means q sub x equals p sub y. So it's just a rephrasing of that test. Okay, so it makes sense to go looking for a potential function little f of x, whose x partial derivative is 2xy minus sine x, and whose yth partial derivative is x squared plus 2y. Here's the algorithm I use to find this potential function. What I'm going to do is take the first relationship, df dx equals the first component function, and I'm going to integrate both sides with respect to x. So we can think of that as returning back the function f of x and y equals some antiderivative of 2xy minus sine x integrated with respect to x, treating y like a constant. So if I go through and integrate that with respect to x, we get x squared y for the first term plus cosine x. Now normally you would look at this and say that's an indefinite integral, I need to add a plus c. But here we're working with two variables and we only integrated with respect to one of them, treating the other one like a constant. So instead of writing plus c, I'm gonna write plus g of y where my plus g of y is my constant of integration. So what is g of y? Well, it could be a function of y. We may need it to be a function of y, or it could just be a basic constant. So that could be any dependence on y that we don't really detect from the coordinate p, or just a plain old constant. It covers both cases. Okay, this is the form of the potential function, but we don't yet know what that g of y is. So then we come over to our second relationship and say that df dy should be equal to x squared plus 2y, the second component function q. So what I'm now going to do is take this expression I have for f, x squared y plus cosine x plus g of y, and differentiate it with respect to y, treating x like a constant. We'll compare that with q. So we'll say df dy going through is x squared plus zero, plus g prime of y, and then that needs to be equal to the second coordinate function, x squared plus two y, so that's q. Now you look at what they have in common, the x squareds match up. 
That must mean that g prime of y is 2y. g prime of y equals 2y gives us a way now to find g of y. We just take an antiderivative. The mystery function g of y that we introduced two lines above must be y squared plus a constant since the general antiderivative of 2y would be y squared plus c. Now that we found g of y, there's nothing mysterious remaining about our expression for f of x and y. We fully computed it at this point. So f of x and y is x squared plus cosine x, that's what we had already detected a few lines above, plus y squared plus c. If you were just looking for one potential function, you could set c to be zero and have f of x and y equals x squared y plus cosine x plus y squared, but c could be any constant here. So what we've really found is an entire family of potential functions. So the general process here was to integrate the first coordinate function with respect to x. That gives you like a rough draft version of your potential function. And then we differentiate with respect to y to find all of the missing information that we didn't get with our first calculation. Once you're done, it's easy to check your answer. Take the gradient of this potential function. If I differentiate with respect to x, I get 2xy minus sine of x. That's exactly my first coordinate function for my vector field. Then differentiate with respect to y, we get x squared plus 0 plus 2y, and that's exactly q. So it's a nice process because it's easy to see at the end if you've done it correctly. Now let's look at a vector field defined on all of our three. So f of x and y is the vector field x, y, z, sine of x times y, e to the z squared. Is this vector field a conservative vector field on all of our three? If so, let's find the potential function whose gradient would be this vector field. Our test for vector fields in R3 is to compute what we call the curl. Curl of f is the name of it, but computationally, it helps me compute it if I write it as the gradient symbol cross f, where this is like a symbolic cross product. So what I'm gonna do is write a three by three grid. It's gonna look like a cross product. So my first row is i, j, k in the usual way, and placeholders. My second row is what would normally be the first vector in a cross product, but here it's going to be the operators ddx, ddy, ddz. And then my third row is the vector field f. So x, y, z for the first entry in that row, sine of x, y, and then e to the z squared. Now what we do is we compute a traditional cross product except what's going to happen is that the operators on the second row, when they meet an entry on the third row, they do that action. So for my first coordinate, it's d dy of e to the z squared, but that's zero, minus d d z of sine x y, and that's also zero. The second entry in this kind of cross product would be d d z, of x, y, z, and that's just gonna be x, y, minus d, d, x of e to the z squared, and that's zero. If I wanted the curl of f, I would keep going, but notice that this is not gonna be zero, it's gonna be x, y, and that's not always zero for all points x, y, z in, in R3. So if I'm just testing if this vector field is a conservative vector field, there's no reason to continue. Let's just go ahead and stop because it's not. It's not conservative. If you're disappointed that I stopped, don't worry. In the next example, we will compute the entire curl. So if you want to see the full computation, let's go on to example three. Same question as before, but for this vector field, f of x, y, and z equals negative 2y, 9y squared minus 2z squared minus 2x minus 2z, and then minus 4yz minus 2y. Is this a conservative vector field? If so, let's find a potential function, or rather we'll find the entire family of potential functions. Just like before, we need to compute the curl of this vector field. It's defined on all of our three, so our test is valid. Um, this vector field is kind of big, so let me write a very large array. It's going to look like that. 
with I, J, K on the first row. My second row is the operations of DDX, DDY, and DDZ. And then my third row is the vector field, so negative 2y for the first coordinate, 9y squared minus 2z squared minus 2x minus 2z for the second coordinate, and then minus 4yz minus 2y for the third coordinate. Okay, now we need to do this curl cross product. So ddy of minus 4yz minus 2y is going to be minus 4z minus 2. And then we'll subtract off of that ddz of this expression, that large second entry. So that's going to be minus 4z minus 2. I think that's good news. So here's that computation. Looks like they are going to cancel out, so it makes sense for us to keep going. For the second entry, ddz of negative 2y is 0. ddx of negative 4yz minus 2y is also 0. So that second entry is just going to be 0. And then for the last entry in this cross product, ddx of the second term is just minus 2. Hey, that's good. Minus ddy of this term, that's also minus 2. So minus 2 minus minus 2 is also 0. So the curl of this vector field is 0 which means it makes sense for us to go looking for a potential function. Okay, we don't need this curl anymore, so let me erase all this. Our methodology to find the potential function for this vector field in R3 is going to be the same as in R2, except that we have more steps because we have more coordinates. It begins the same way, though. Whatever my potential function is, its x partial derivative is negative 2y, the p-coordinate. So let's anti-differentiate that first component function with respect to x. So when I anti-differentiate negative 2y with respect to x, I get negative 2xy, but I only integrated with respect to x, which means that y and z have been treated like constants. So there are probably a lot of terms, depending on just y and z, or maybe a combination of them that we didn't detect with this antiderivative. So the constant of integration here is plus g of y and z. So this covers functions of just y, functions of just z, functions that mix y and z together, and also pure constants. However, this is our antiderivative, we just don't know what capital G is yet. To start to piece together what capital G must be, let's take this potential function now and differentiate it with respect to y. That's going to step from the first coordinate function to the second one. So just based on the line above, df dy must have the form negative 2x plus dg dy. Let's compare this now to what we know df dy should be, which is the second component function. So that's 9y squared minus 2z squared minus 2x minus 2z. That's all of q of x, y, and z. They have the negative 2x's in common, so we can imagine canceling those out and conclude that whatever g is, its y partial derivative is 9y squared minus 2z squared minus 2z. Now we repeat this process of anti-differentiating with respect to one of the variables. So whatever g is, this is its y partial derivative. So let's integrate both sides with respect to y to get a better, more specific form for capital G. So whatever g of y and z is, it should be an antiderivative of the above expression with respect to y. So that's going to be 3y cubed for the first term, minus 2yz squared for the second term, minus 2yz for the third term. But since we anti-differentiated here with respect to y, we treated z like a constant. So the constant of integration that we need here for this anti-differentiation must include possible z dependence. At this point, we finished the algorithm for the first two coordinates. Let's kind of summarize what's happened so far. So as of right now, what is our potential function? Well, we started with a general expression, negative 2xy plus g of y and z. That is the form of the potential function, but now we can say more about g of y and z. g of y and z itself must have the form 3y squared minus 2yz squared minus 2yz plus some yet undiscovered function of z. 
To figure out what h of z, the remaining mystery here, has to look like, we now step over to the third coordinate function. Let's differentiate f of x, y, and z as written with respect to z. Term by term, that's going to be 0, 0, and then we do have some z dependents here, so minus 4yz, minus 2y, and then whatever h is, it would be h prime of z. Since this is a conservative vector field, that has to be equal to the third component function. So that should be equal to negative 4yz minus 2y, or in other words, capital R of x, y, and z. Okay, now we compare both sides. Notice that everything here cancels out, leaving us with h prime of z equals 0. That means that h of z is actually really just a constant. We didn't know that until this moment. So now let's put it all together. Our potential function is negative 2xy plus 3y cubed minus 2yz squared minus 2yz, and then before where I had written plus h of z up here, we're now going to say just plus c. And that gives us our entire family of potential functions. Once again, you can check your work. Differentiate this with respect to x. That only has that first term, so that would be negative 2y. That checks out. Then differentiate with respect to y, we get negative 2x. Let me do this term by term. Okay, negative 2x is there, plus 9y squared is here. And then where am I? Minus 2z squared is that second term. And then minus 2z. Okay, good. Overall, we did get the second component function. Now differentiate with respect to z, we get nothing, nothing. Minus 4yz, that's the first term minus 2y. Therefore, the algorithm worked, and we found our potential functions. This algorithm can be intimidating, but I think it's good to just go ahead and start doing it. Right? It's one of those things, there's no point in kind of agonizing over it. Just grab the first coordinate function, anti-differentiate with respect to x, and you're off. If you need to practice this, there's an easy way to practice. Just write down a potential function, compute its gradient, that's your conservative vector field, and then see if you can undo that action, right? So given any scalar valued function of two or three variables, you can compute its gradient. You have a conservative vector field at that point. So then practice this algorithm to see if you can get back to the function that you yourself wrote down to start. Okay, good luck with that. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for your attention.